Hello and welcome to our session on the next generation of MMM. We're going to be discussing the latest tools, innovations and methodologies that are revolutionizing marketing mix modeling, providing marketers with deeper insights, more accurate decision making capabilities and better return on investment. Today I'm joined by Igor Skoken, who's the marketing science director at Meta and Zach Bricker, who is the lead solutions engineer at Supermetrics. Iggy, Zach, it is great to see you. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm going to get straight into it. Zach, question for you. What is MMM? So MMM stands for Marketing Mixed Modeling, and it's a statistical analysis technique um, that aims to quantify the impact of a bunch of different marketing inputs and in some cases, external inputs um, in order to better examine the historical data. Um, deconstruct all that data and then measure the effectiveness of your uh, different marketing campaigns and marketing activities. So whether the marketing activity is I have my campaign or I have a creative that's changing helps to quantify and give you uh, information in, in order to better your ROI. So I would just say, I would add that really for me and for us at Meta, we've seen that it's a really powerful tool to measure the business holistically. Uh, so not only the media or the marketing, but also the macro factors, actual factors, things that are, you know, sometimes even out of the control and really helps to understand the business performance in overall and then perform, you know, the what if analyses and budget allocations and you know, other things on top of it. So really sometimes people talk about MLM as media mix modeling. For us, it has always been marketing mix modeling and really like the business, business, business modeling. So we know that MMM has changed uh, over the years. And uh, Iggy, I'd love to hear from you in the key ways in which MMM has changed. So, you know, in fact, MMM is a very old technique. It has been around for, say, maybe 50 years, maybe even more, let's say 50 years. So, but it way, way predates the internet. And, and it's actually interesting because now it's sort of re-emerging as a privacy first uh, aggregate type of analysis and it's because it never actually had any of the data that is available um, or was available for a short period of time. So, but anyway, the, the old ways of MMM, it was very much handmade, a lot of craft, a lot of building by the analyst. It was slow. Uh, it was sort of validated only statistically and, uh, and consequently all of these things, because it was such a hard, such a like artisanal experience, it made it very much expensive. But whenever these, there are challenges like this, um, I'm, I'm sure you, you would agree and, and uh, uh, people in the Super Summit would agree that digital skills have to track record and disruption. So MMM is changing, it's sort of being digitally enabled, faster, shorter, you know, calibrated and increasingly using automation with machine learning and some, some you know, it, it's, it's like a next generation of MMM. So whatever was uh, hygiene in the old days, uh, we now are discussing data gray and granularity and high precision analysis and high accuracy and really the methodological uh, improvements that, to the underlying uh, regression. So MMM at heart, it's statistics, but combine this with the modern machine learning and you know, cloud processing and it really transforms. And this is where this is where we are today. So the data, let's talk data there. What types of data are typically used in MMM and how do you gather this data? Zach, I'm going to I'm gonna put that question to you. So one of the primary things that you see is your sales data and your media spend data. Those are the two sort of base information points that you want to start bringing in when you think about an MMM. And this is from how do I go from small and at least start something to start to to push up to those larger MMMs where you are taking into account things like macroeconomic indicators, which uh, Iggy had mentioned previously, um, competitive data, and then your additional digital metrics and promotion data that you might be sending out. So, and the way that you gather this data is now primarily through uh, APIs. Previously, what you would see is you would have to wait 30 days or 60 days for your television commercial or your radio, your radio ad spot um, or your, your billboards to 
report data back to you and say, okay, this is what you spent and these are how many people passed your billboard, or this is how many, you know, we've estimated have heard your ad on the radio. Well, now we can get that data much faster through APIs. We can get it much more verifiable way and a way that in which we can trust our providers and say, hey, you know, this data is, is going to be accurate. And one of the real benefits that you start to see when you work with these APIs is you can also speed up the rate in which you tune or uh, refactor your MMMs to account for these uh, these rapid changes. Um, and the way that you, you want to ingest that data uh, coming from those those APIs is you know preferably with um, a strong platform, either a third party or that you build yourself, um, and it will help alleviate some of those issues with with trust as well. Um, in the previous previous years, you were relying on the analyst and you were relying on the data coming from those those older platforms. And now that we have data coming from these newer platforms, that we suffer less from bias, um, we can also start to trust that data more versus the previous iterations. So obviously when it comes to data, um, accuracy and, and reliability is is central to data. Is there methods that you can use to validate the accuracy and reliability of MMM mo models? Um, Iggy, any thoughts there? Yes. I mean, this, uh, this, is, this is really probably this, you know, data is, is the most important thing. Having the right granular and correct and high, high powered, uh, data is, is really, really important. And for us at Meta, we actually have developed our MMM feed very recently. Uh, actually the feed existed for a while, but this is the data that is, uh, designed specifically for high, high grade, high cadence, granular fast modeling. And, um, since June, this is, uh, now available. Uh, via the MMM APR, the MMM endpoint of the inside API, so really enables that kind of fast modeling that uh, Zach was uh, Zach was talking about. But beyond the data, the second or probably the ultimate most important thing is the validation uh, of uh, MMM as a result. So the way how this is done and and the, and the calibration of these results is via real world incremental experiments. So these are especially easy to do on digital and you know, say for meta, we have our version lift. Um, Zach mentioned this trust. I described the old, you know, memory of the old as handmade crafty thing. So as a consequence, this has a lot of analyst bias. A lot of the analyst personality coming through the mods. Now craft in MMM is not a good thing. So any, <laughs> it's, it's like, you, you know, you don't necessarily want it there. So, I, so. Complete removal of bias is yet not achievable. We haven't quite gotten there yet. So, but however, it is possible to minimize C. Uh, and this is done via validation and calibration with real world experiments. Uh, so the, to ensure validity, the models have to be statistically robust, but this is where the old models finished. They, they will tell you R squared is this much or mean error is this. And people would say, okay, this is not a good model, but this is actually not true. So to ensure accuracy, really statistical validity must be there. But for that is there are even obviously deeper metrics than R squared, but they has models have to be calibrated and validated using real world, uh, experiments and tests. Um, and that is, uh, that is, I think help us to triangulate the, the, the data coming out of MMM because at the end it's a model and, and of, and triangulated with the real world experiments. And this is, uh, this is how it's done. So you talked, we've talked to like a little bit about, um, this big, that, you know, there's been a shift in MMM and we know that there's been significant, some seismic shifts that have happening in the marketing landscape, um, and in technology. What do you see as the future trends and developments and MM, uh, future trends and developments in MMM, especially with regards to those new shifts happening in the marketing landscape, Zach, any, any thoughts on what those future trends might be? Yeah, I see a lot of the future trends coming with what, what you see every day. Um, everybody, it seems like is well aware of the different LLMs that are out there, your chat GPT, BARD, everybody is, every, all the, the large uh, tech organizations are coming out with a version of an LLM. And what we're really seeing is the evolution of AI. And we're seeing it happen very quickly. Um, as with most things in computing, 
uh, we, we, we plateau and then it accelerates almost exponentially. Um, and one of the, the cool things you see with that with especially is uh, with uh, creative aspects of it. Um, so being able to generate images. So uh, I see uh, going into the future that AI and deep learning is going to really start to inform and really take off in helping inform and, as, as Iggy mentioned, start to help remove more and more of the bias in these uh, in these different AI and different statistical models, not just MMMs, but other ones that exist as well. You have, you know, ones that measure uh, like Bayesian causal uh, factors. Um, and so as you integrate those, you're going to see more of that uh, coming through. Um, as I mentioned as well, the real-time nature of it, Iggy mentioned the stream. Um, that's going to be a really interesting uh, endpoint to have because what uh, you had to do previously was you would generate an MMM, um, as Iggy had talked about crafting one, but you would create this MMM and if you had a really strong uh, computational center uh, back in the day, you could maybe retune these once every three months reasonably um, or longer, depending on you know how far you went back. But now that you're going to have data flowing in uh, you can set up an entire pipeline. You can really have those MMMs running on uh, a fairly continual basis as you adjust new data and respond, not just to the large shift and changes that happen over a month or a quarter, but ones that happen every single day. So as was with most things that we see, uh, we tend to be uh, getting faster and faster at producing those results. And, and hopefully um, we've you know, we've started to tune for actionability in our MMMs versus just informationally. Um, one of the big things that I've seen coming from MMMs of the past was they're really giving you information. And if you had someone who could interpret it well enough, uh, you had a little bit of insight and some actionability coming from the data. Whereas as we mature, you know, actionability and insight should be the primary things uh, because you know, data largely is it's great to have, but it's hard to really utilize. You have to turn it into information, and these models help do that. And then you you're always going to need that that person on the other end uh, to really lend that insight of this is my model, this is what information I have, and then how do I turn that into a net positive for our organization? How do I take these uh, descriptive uh, and prescriptive approaches and really apply that to get to get to an ROI that I'm looking for. Yeah, I mean, spot on. Um, I would just add a couple of things on this. So first one, uh, a major trend that we see is that this is a technique now being used by a much wider range of businesses. In the past, it was CPGs, you know, retail and so on. And now we see the contemporary modeling being used by gaming advertisers, app first advertisers, digital natives, omnichannel, many, many more. And actually this is a message to, to all of you listening is that sometimes we see the CMOs saying, oh, we've seen MMM, we've done MMM in the past. Like I urge you to like revisit this and said, oh, it's not for us. This, this is something that we don't want. I urge you to revisit this um, and try to see the progress that has been made in the last 18 to 24 months in MMM has been tremendous. And there is, you know, it's a completely new kind of experience that you that you can get, as Zach was mentioning, with these uh, automated, semi-automated, you know, uh, ongoing experimental calibrated machine learning models. It's a very, very different thing. Uh, so we also see uh, companies having um, much more clear data strategies and infrastructure that are built intentionally uh, for these kind of models, you know, be it APIs or, you know, variable creation or like ongoing experimental calibration, so like systems in place that allows to to actually power the the, the kind of technology that, uh, that does this. So solutions now exist, you know, as an example, one by Supermetrics, but, you know, look around, it's, it's really, we predict that this space is growing, will continue to grow in the near future, and we've seen many more semi-automated modeling solutions that can be run, calibrated, operated on a continuous basis. And this is the kind of trend that we see. So, Iggy, you mentioned there that um, CMOs might have a perception of MMM isn't for us. Why do you think that perception exists? 
So some of them, some of the CMOs may have experienced the error of the past. And that was, you know, that as we mentioned earlier, they had a lot of challenges. It was slow. It wasn't actionable. It wasn't giving the kind of information that is needed or it was coming every six months or every 12 months, some kind of high level stats. Um, so it may be just that they have not experienced the modern MMM. And then the, the, the more contemporary CMOs may have not come across MMM because they, in the past, were using attribution and TA uh, or kind of identity-based um, models that are, you know, becoming less and less viable, uh, if not completely unviable uh, going forward. Okay, so there's definitely been some, yeah, some significant changes and a lot of opportunity there. Um, I think, Zach, you touched on on the the magic three letters, which is ROI. Um, but I would put this question question to both of you um, because I think I think a lot of uh, a lot of people attending and listening to it are going to be very curious on how can businesses calculate the ROI for specific channels based on MMM findings. Yeah, so your ROI, it's actually pretty straightforward. So you look at your incremental uh, incremental sales from the, the profit margin, right? Uh, you subtract that by your cost, and then you divide by the, the cost of the channel. So uh, the basic ROI is, is very, very easy to describe. It's very easy to do. Um, but there are all those externalities that that happen, you know, we're talking about MMMs and, and historically MMMs have, have not been cheap. Um, now with new SaaS platforms, uh, faster ways to do things, you know, uh, maybe you mentioned to be uh, semi-automated, automated platforms, we can bring those costs down. Um, but you still want to layer in the cost of, you know, how much does this take in my time, uh, my team's time, and then how much are we spending on this to really find the right platform and the right, right way in which you want to implement this. Because the, the, you know, the last thing any business wants to do is spend a, an exorbitant amount of money on a research project that ultimately costs more than they're getting back. You know, they're, they raised, you know, sales by 1%, but it costs you 8% of your total budget. You know, so you want to avoid things like that, but that's, that's how they would start to calculate the ROIs for those findings. We say that, uh, the, any MMM model in you know is investment is only worth it as much as the positive actions that you can take a result of this this model so really the best models have actionability as the purpose of the model and they ensure forecasting and simulations are run often and many and positive actions are taken out of this the very very best models that we've seen operationalized is those are built in partnership with the cfo so when cfo and cmo come together and they share the model idea, the model goals, and sort of co-own and co-create, and have a mutual understanding of the methodology and how to act, what are we gonna do with these results? We have seen the transformation and growth, and eventually, marketing Charles ROI uh, increase. So really, they I would say that when you are thinking about the ROI of the models, think about the actionability and request this uh, simulation and ongoing uh, information flow back into the business so you can take positive actions on it. Makes complete sense. Um, so you have talked a lot about the shift that's happening and why businesses um, and, and the opportunity with MMM. Um, so let's say a business is, is looking to implement MMM for the first time. What advice would, would you both give them? Uh, Iggy, I'll start with you. Any, any words of wisdom? Yeah. So, so we, 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 a lot of companies ask us this. So like, can we build this in-house and what's the co most cost, cost effective way? Uh, Zach mentioned it a couple of times, you know, MMM has this reputation for high costs and, uh, but is, is in-housing any cheap? Really, really depends on the goals, the vision and the current talent that the organization has. So in-housing is a totally feasible journey. Uh, but to be clear, like having built in-house requires expertise. You need to have statistical business science, data science expertise. This needs investments in people and tools and, you know, to culture for, to retain this kind of talent. And, but it's also true that, you know, 
analysts and data scientists are much more uh, available or there is more people in the skill set than five and, you know, definitely 10 years. So, you know, in-housing MMM, like many things, can lead to more flexibility and more control over the data. And, you know, you can add a KPI, remove a KPI, test this, test that, you know, have a nested structure, whatnot. It's closer than to the proprietary sensitive sensitive data about your business. So that's also it's good and you know having a deep understanding of the model not being but on the other hand there are some incredible specialist companies and consultancies out there with the latest and and the best contemporary mmms they are transparent validated incrementally calibrated they know what they're doing uh high cadence of high quality insights so really just look around uh so you could also go hybrid we've seen this that partnering with some of these consultancies or, or companies on a SaaS basis, uh, we, you know, we've seen this with ad tech, right? So our businesses have their own ad tech relationship, but that doesn't mean they don't use a specialist agent or a specialist uh, partner. They just use them in a, in a, in a uh, different ways. So at Meta, we have also built uh, an open source MMM called, we, called, we call it Project Robin. It's released on GitHub uh, to the data science community. So it's, you know, people can just, but you still need you need a lot of skills to operationalize. So I would say the advice number one that I give people, so set yourself three-year plan, regardless of where you are today, start with a collaboration with a trusted MMM provider, look at your vision, look at your goals, look at your talent, and it may be that you end up having an in-house model in three years uh, with, with this part of being a consultant, or you might just like their product and tool and you just decide to keep it that way. So really it's uh it's all feasible awesome zach any advice so what iggy had mentioned are all of the uh, different steps that i would also take in order to start out with mmms um one of the primary things and you know the first thing he mentioned was you know starting small um it, because you don't want to make that that large investment into a tool just with any other software tool or platform you don't want to make a huge investment without you know having a goal in mind so start small make sure that what you're doing is going to produce results for you or if it's not that you're going to be able to exit without as much of uh, an impact to your business right um and the reason you would exit can be you can't ensure clean data for any reason um, you're not able to stay updated or you don't have the resources to manage even a SaaS platform. That that happens. Resourcing is always, you know, always important and always a, a challenge that we face. Um, the next thing I would do is ensure that your data is uh, clean and comprehensive. So when you're bringing your data in, because it, you know, it's going to be one of two ways, really. Either you're working with a consultancy in that hybrid model where you may be bringing them data. Um, so if you're bringing them data, their, their results are only going to be as good as the data that you acquired. Um, the same way as it is in-house, you know, your, your data scientists, um, and your analysts are only going to be able to build a model as well as, as the data is provided. Um, or you have that, that other method where you go fully automated with a, a platform and they're pulling your data and make sure that the way that they're pulling your data in, once you've given them access. It is going to be, you know, clean, comprehensive, and have a lot of checks and validations to make sure that they're not pulling in data incorrectly. That they have necessary information um, in from they have the necessary information to validate your data. So that could be the campaign naming schemas, um, all the different dimensions that they're going to need in order to break down your data into the uh, categorical and explanatory variables that they need in order to provide you with a good model. So those are the first sort of two big things that, that I would recommend. Um, I think he had mentioned, you know, the, the experts in the field, um, whether you are hiring an expert on, you're hiring an agency, or you just want to partner with one, find an expert, even if it's just one person, to help you map out your strategy. Um, so they can, you have an expert to go in and analyze where your weaknesses are, what you need to do before you even start doing an MMM in order to, you know, give you the highest probability of success. Um, and then obviously, you know, the, the big things are staying updated with the space, making sure that as the landscape evolves, that you're also uh, being, you know, sort of constantly um, revisiting and, and recalibrating your models. 
Uh, you should be able to do that. You, you should be able to do real time and then or near real time. And then they're, um, depending on the volume of your data, it may not be necessary to do it every day. Uh, you know, the, the advice I give to a lot of our customers when they ask about uh, real time data and, you know, depending on my, you know, with, with my data set, how often should I be looking at my data? For me, reasonably, it's the speed at which you make decisions. If you're not making decisions on your spend every day, it's not really necessary for you to be worried about a real-time model. If you're making decisions every week, you know, look at it every three days. Um, because you also don't want to overwhelm yourself. You, you can, there, there's a very uh, famous saying inside of statistics of, you know, uh, paralysis by analysis. And so if, if you focus on the real-time nature of things, you, you don't want to get too involved with it where you're just waiting for a number to tick up by point one, right? And if you are in that space and you have that amount of data and you can benefit off of that, then build an automated system to it. Don't look at it, at it yourself. That's terrible. Um, that would not be a fun existence. Um, and then, you know, lastly is uh, integrating insights. So I'm a huge proponent of softwares and platforms as a service, of automating things, um, but from my data science background, there is a lot of value from my perspective in being able to integrate insights from subject matter experts. So while I may be a, an excellent data scientist and I might have a great team that can incorporate a lot of what we learn, at the end of the day, I am not a performance marketer. Um, I am not you know, the creative director who can analyze what this MMM or what any other model has given me and, and look for those uh, situations where not that it's incorrect, but it's not, it needs more time to mature based off of what they've seen in the past. Sometimes creative takes longer to, to trigger. Um, so make sure that, you know, while you are trusting your, your data sources and, and hopefully you've got a trusted partner, um, your in-house team, or, you know, if, if you're, if you're going with the, the hybrid model that you also make sure not to discount the human element of it. Um, you want to make sure that you are bringing in someone who is an expert in the field that you're measuring. I, I know you mentioned that they don't look at that strictly for marketing, but all of media to make sure the people who are experts in that are involved and that they're looking at because um, there are the ones who are going to be able to to really take that uh, that model, um, look at the insight and actionability that it's recommending and apply that to your strategy um, it, it, in the best way uh, that they can. Awesome. I think that's um, some pretty good advice in terms of next steps for our businesses. And it's certainly, I think you both certainly hi uh, highlighted that the challenge of MMM in the past uh, presents a really, really great opportunity for today. Um, so yeah, fantastic. Iggy, Zach, thank you so much for this session. Um, again, I think if an organization is ready to move past gut intuition, uh, and and into a more future focused marketing strategy, then I think the next generation of MMM might be the right solution for them. Um, so I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kay. Thank you, Zach. And uh, enjoy everyone. Enjoy the Super Summit 2023. Thank you, thank you, Kay. Everyone, I hope you had a good time and uh, found the day formative. Thank you.